So our eighth learning unit is on electron configuration and chemical periodicity. So only two skills that we'll have in this uh, learning unit. The first is expanding on our quantum theory that we had in our last learning unit. And so we're gonna learn about the fourth quantum number. And then we sort of move on. And once we understand exactly where electrons are in the periodic table, uh, or electrons are in atoms, we can understand the organization of the periodic table. And so think about trends in periodic um, uh, properties like atomic size or ionization energy or things like that. So dealing first with electron configuration, I'm going to give a brief review of the three quantum numbers that we learned in our last learning unit, and then we'll move on and we'll introduce a fourth um, quantum number, which really allows us to uh, give the exact code for specific electrons that we're talking about. So remember the three codes that we learned in our last learning unit are going to start giving us information about where an electron lives. And so we can talk about the principal quantum number, which we define as n. So that's again a positive integer that tells us the size and energy level of the orbital. From a practical sense, this is the row that you are on the periodic table for that specific atom. Then we have the angular momentum quantum number, which we know as L. I'm going to give you a little trick in a, in a minute to know the difference and help you think about is it angular momentum, is it magnetic uh, uh, quantum momentum quantum number, or is it the spin? So that's going to be our fourth one. So I'm going to give you a trick in just a minute to kind of help remember those names as well. So the angular momentum quantum number, which we just know as L, is going to be something that is an integer between 0 and n minus 1. So whatever the n that we have here, it's going to be integer values between 0 and 1 minus that number. And that describes the shape of the orbital uh, that we have. So 0 is going to tell us we've got an s orbital, 1 is going to be for a p orbital, 2 is for a d orbital, and 3 is for an f orbital. And then the last quantum number that we learned in our last learning unit was this magnetic quantum number. So this magnetic momentum quantum number, m sub l. Again, an integer value here that's between minus l and l. And this is going to tell us the orientation. So we really didn't have a practical sort of um, on the periodic table way of really thinking about this up to this point. But we talked about counting the number of m sub l's that we have. And that tells us the number of orbitals that we have. So for example, an s orbital is going to have only one orbital that holds two electrons. When we have p, that's really three orbitals that hold a total of six electrons. d is going to be five orbitals for 10 electrons, and f is seven orbitals for 14 electrons. So if you need a little bit of a refresher and a review, go back and look at um, the, uh, the, the uh, Edpuzzle videos that we have here for our last learning unit on these previous three quantum numbers. But we're gonna move on to the fourth quantum number, which is the spin quantum number. And that's why there's little, this little s here, uh, m sub s. The only values that you have to remember is this is either a plus one half or a minus one half. And that describes the direction of the electron spin. Two electrons are in each orbital. One has to be what we call spin up. So we're gonna identify that as plus one half. One has to be spin down, and we'll identify that as minus one half. And this has to do with what we call the Pauli exclusion principle. So we're gonna learn a few rules that are gonna play into our coding system here. Because no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers, once we get down to this last level of quantum numbers, and we're only talking about two possible electrons, one that spin up and one that spin down, we assign this spin quantum number as either plus one half or minus one half. So let's go through a couple of examples to sort of um, uh, think about this. So in our last learning unit, we talked about maybe thinking about um, quantum numbers where maybe n is equal to 2. We're on the second row of the periodic table. Well, if we're in the second row of the periodic table, the possible values for L are L equals 0 or L equals 1. If we have L equals 0, that would be an s orbital. L equals 1 would be a p orbital. When we go further and we identify what are the possible m sub l values, m sub l values, right, run between minus l and l, including zero. Well, if l is equal to zero, then m sub l can only be equal to zero if l equals zero. For l equals one, m sub l could be equal to minus one, zero, or plus one. So that's all information from last time. What we're expanding on now is this spin quantum number. And so for any of these situations, the spin quantum number is either going to be equal to minus one half 
or plus one half. I think this will make a little bit more sense once we actually do something with electron um, orbital diagrams. But we're going to do a couple of problems first here where we practice kind of looking at the code and having different quantum numbers. So let's just go through an example here. Um, we still could have an electron that lives in n equals 2, lives in the second row of the periodic table. It still could be something that lives in L equals 1, so a p orbital. It still to that end could have an m sub L equal to 0. But if we're talking about this first electron, let's imagine that this first electron here was n equals 2, L equals 1, m sub L equals 0, and m sub s, let's say, is minus 1 half. Right now, three of the four quantum numbers are the same for this electron. So again, we've got the same principle, the same angular momentum, the same magnetic momentum. Those three quantum numbers are the same. So what that must mean is that m sub s must be equal to plus 1 half because it has to be different. So again, just to highlight here with these colors, if this guy is the same, this guy is the same, this guy is the same, this one must be different because no two electrons can have the same uh, four quantum numbers. Okay, We're going to go through uh, in an example here just to think about um, Imagine box seats or you know seats in a baseball stadium. Remember we had a football stadium before to think about kind of the size issue that we have with how small a nucleus of an, uh, of an atom is. We've got that as a P on the 50 yard line. And then we've got the space that the electron has to run around is the size of the entire stadium. So let's think about that stadium analogy again. And let's imagine that these unique sets of quantum numbers represent to the uh, specific box seat at a game, for example. So you can imagine, just like we had here, somebody might be sitting in the same uh, section, right? We're gonna find that as N. Somebody might be sitting in the same section as you, right? Somebody might even be sitting in the same box as you. They might have the same L value. They might even be sitting in the same row as you, the same M sub L value. But they cannot be sitting in the same seat as you. Right? So a lot of times seats will have the same seat numbers. You might be seat 16 or seat 18. Somebody could have that same seat 16, but they can't be in the same row and the same section and the same uh, box as you. So if you want to think about this as a ticket that describes an electron's exact place where they can be, uh, no two electrons can be in the same place at the same time, those quantum numbers are going to define that. So that's kind of completing our four-part code, if you will. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to just go through and highlight for you as a way to sort of remember, we've got N, we've got L, we've got M sub L, and then we've got M sub S. So probably easy enough for us to remember that hierarchy. N is row on the periodic table. L is our, our shape, whether it's S, P, D, or F. M sub L is going to be uh, a value that runs between minus L and plus L, and then M sub S is either minus one half or plus one half. So that might be okay to remember these, um, these abbreviations, but I do want you to also know the names, okay? N is our principal quantum number. That one is kind of unique, but when we get to this angular momentum, magnetic momentum, this spin quantum number, those can get confusing. But if you just kind of want to remember, so we've got angular, magnetic, and then spin. If you want to remember that those go in alphabetical order in terms of kind of the, the fine tuning that we get of that information, maybe that'll help make sense. So angular is going to be L, that comes before magnetic, that's the M sub L, that comes before spin, which is the M sub S. I do want you to know those names because you might see a problem that doesn't use N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. It uses the actual names, principal quantum number, angular quantum number, magnetic quantum number, and then spin quantum numbers. Okay, so now let's talk about filling up our seats, right? Rather than just talking about one electron and its own ticket, let's talk about taking an atom and filling up all the electrons in that atom. So that's equating for our analogy to thinking about all the people at the ball game, right? If we want to think about where we're going to put them, we always want to have the best seats available so that they're happy, so that they're stable. 
The same is true here for electrons. The best seats, those are gonna be the lowest energy levels. We're gonna fill those up first. We're gonna fill those up, those seats first in the house, and then we're gonna move on up. So this is what we call the Aufbau principle. So just kind of what, running through these names, the Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. We're gonna talk about the Aufbau principle, which basically says if you're gonna fill electrons up, we're gonna start with the lowest energy, and we're gonna move up. We don't kind of jump around. Nobody comes last in line and gets the best seat in the house. Okay, first in line gets the best seat in the house, lowest energy. So S fills first, then P, then D and F in general, okay? But think about this if we're filling seats in, in a theater, right? Sometimes the, the best seats in an upper level might be better than the worst seats on the lower level, right? The first row of the balcony might be preferable to the back row of the floor level. So we kind of have this issue of once you get higher up, what's the best seat in the house, right? Nobody's gonna argue that floor seats right in front of the stage are gonna be the best. And so we kind of have a hierarchy going up here that makes sense. We're gonna fill 1S first, then 2S and 2P, then 3S and 3P. But once we get to the fourth row, once we get to that fourth principal quantum number, then things get a little bit fuzzy. And because these energy levels are so similar, we tend to sort of hop around too. We're, we're gonna go 4S and then we go to 3D, then the 4P and then the 5S. So I'm gonna show you a way that your periodic table could again be one of your best cheat sheets for this. All right, so another important skill that we're gonna have in this learning unit is how we actually depict where electrons are. And there's two things that we're gonna use for this. The first is what we call electron configuration. And this is a shorthand notation that's gonna tell us the principal energy level, so that principal quantum number, that N, a letter, a letter that designates the sublevel, which is that L value, so S, P, D, or F, and then the number of electrons in that orbital that's indicated with the superscript. So maybe you've heard about this. We've said it before in a previous uh, learning unit video, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, right? And thinking about those electrons as they fill those orbitals. But a challenge with electron configurations is they don't explicitly allow us to define all the quantum numbers. If we're looking at an electron configuration, we can't define quantum numbers just by looking directly at that. To assign quantum numbers, you really wanna be looking at an orbital diagram. And we're gonna go through an example of this in just a second here. Orbital diagrams basically are gonna have a box for each orbital. Remember, each orbital holds two electrons. And so we're gonna have boxes for each orbital in a given energy level. We're gonna group them by sublevel with what we call an N, L designation. So N is that principal quantum number, and then L is whether it's S, P, D, or F. Okay, I'm gonna go through a couple of examples here, and then we'll actually physically do a couple of examples. Let's take the simplest case, hydrogen. Hydrogen, atomic number one. We've only got one electron. It's going to be one electron in a 1s orbital. We're just kind of marching through the periodic table here. Helium, having two electrons, is going to completely fill this um, orbital. Now remember, just like we learned about over here, right, Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers, and since we're going to have both of these electrons occupying the same principal quantum number, n equals one, angular momentum quantum number, l equals zero, and then we've got m sub l equal to zero as well, the thing that must be different is the m sub s, the spin. This guy needs to be spin down, okay? And we'll go through a couple more examples here. But as we continue to march through here, once we get to the second row of the periodic table, now we're gonna have these two p orbitals. But we can see here that they're empty for beryllium here. Beryllium is going to fill with four electrons, the 1s orbital, and then it's gonna fill the 2s orbital. So the electron configuration for beryllium here, we would say is 1s2, 2s2, and then if we did an orbital diagram, we'd say that we're gonna have the 1s orbital that's completely filled and the 2s orbital that's completely filled. Now let me go through an example here right now and I'm gonna do another example in a minute. Let's imagine that we wanted to figure out the quantum numbers, the four quantum numbers for this specific electron, okay? Let me label these here. This would be the first electron, 
the second electron, the third electron, and the fourth electron. So let's say we wanted to figure out those quantum numbers for the fourth electron. Well, for the fourth electron here, n is going to be equal to 2 because we've got that 2 there. L is going to be equal to 0 because we're talking about an s orbital. m sub l must be 0 because that's our only option. And then because it's spin down, m sub s is going to be equal to minus 1 half. I'm going to go through a few more examples here because I know this can get challenging with this coding system. All right, one more rule to think about here, and that has to do with pairing electrons up. So when we have orbitals of equal energy, these three p orbitals are all of equal energy. So when orbitals of equal energy are available, we're going to fill our electrons such that we're going to keep them unpaired until we have to pair them. So said another way, the electron configuration of the lowest energy has the maximum number of unpaired electrons with parallel spins. So as an analogy to help us think about this, imagine you know, you're assigning dorm rooms for students, right? And we're imagining that the, 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 the students are electrons and the dorm rooms are our orbitals. As long as we can, we want to have everybody have singles, no roommates, no pairing up until we have to. So let's take a look at this series here. Here's boron, right? Boron with five electrons is going to start spilling over into the 2p orbitals. We get up to nitrogen here. Nitrogen is going to let everybody be unpaired. Nobody has a roommate yet. But what happens once you get to oxygen is we now need to start buddying up. Notice here too that all of these electrons are spin up, so they would have an m sub s of plus one half. But once we get to this electron here, now we have to start buddying up. So this is going to go in this energy orbital to the left. So again, if we were just to kind of go through the principle or the uh, four quantum numbers for this guy, n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1. When we're labeling these, the m sub l's are going to be labeled as minus 1, 0, and plus 1. Go from left to right with the lowest m sub l value up to the highest m sub l value. So for this guy, m sub l would be equal to minus 1. And this electron is spin down, so m sub s would be minus 1 half. I know, crazy coding system, OK? We're going to go through a few examples in a minute. So I want to kind of highlight some places where this can get a little bit wonky, OK? And a couple of exceptions to these rules that I want to make sure you have up here. Differences that we're going to see between energy levels, again, as we get higher and higher here, these energy differences become better, right? This poor person who's trying to assign seats to people for a show is really getting stressed out because what's the best seat in the house once you start getting up here? They're so similar, right? So we need to be able to think about, you know, what are these rules? We're going to follow some rules for how we fill things. And again, I'm going to show you that the periodic table can be your best cheat sheet for that. Okay. So two things to remember here. I know this looks like there's a lot on this slide, but this is just basically marching us through increasing an atomic number here. And we see predictable trends, right? Each time we keep adding an electron, we keep filling up the next spot in the house. But you'll notice that there's couple, uh, a couple of exceptions. This guy looks a little bit weird, and so does this guy. I need you to remember chromium and copper. I can almost guarantee you, you're going to see a problem with chromium or copper, and they do something unique. So let's look at why they're a little bit weird. Look what we had here with vanadium right before chromium here. We had the next electron you'd think would go right here, right? And we'd, look, we'd see something that just would kind of look like one electron right there. But what happens is you actually take one of these electrons and you move it up there, and then you add your next electron. And the reason is that is that it's actually better to have these d orbitals be either half filled or completely filled and leave an empty seat in your s orbital. I don't know the exact reason for the rule. It's not important for you to even know that, but I do want you to, to know that. For things like chromium and copper, when we involve these d orbitals, it's going to be better to have the d orbital either be half filled or completely filled and leave the vacancy in the s orbital. Okay. 
So how can you use your periodic table as the best cheat sheet, okay? So we can read the periodic table as we go across, right? We've got 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, here's the 2p series, here's the 3s series, and then the 3p series. Now look what happens here. When we get to the fours, all of a sudden that's where we start dipping into what we call the D block here. So we're going to have our configurations go 4s1, 4s2, and then we go to 3d1. Okay, so something to remember, the s's and the p's are always going to have the same principal quantum number. They're always going to have the same number in front of that letter. The d's follow one number behind that, and then the f's, when we see them, are going to follow two numbers behind that. So look at this here. This is 4s2 and then 3d1, right? So notice that the d's are one behind the s's and the p's, okay? Once we get to the f's, this is a little bit hard to see here, so let me blow this up. We've got the s's and then we've got the d's are one number behind the s's and the p's, and then the f's are two numbers behind that. So you can use your periodic table as a cheat sheet, okay? So we've got our, our S's, then S and P, then S and P again, then we're going to have S and then D and then P, S, D, and P, okay? And then we're going to have S, D, F, and then P. So notice here, there's this little gap here. If we actually think about what the periodic table really looks like, I'm going to show you something on the next page here. This is what it's supposed to look like, but if we printed that out, it would take up two pages. But this really shows us how things fill. We're going to have 6s, and then we're going to have the 5d orbitals here, and then the 4f. Okay, So you can use your periodic table to show you how things fill. If you remember that this middle portion is the d block, this little guy that kind of like is supposed to slip in there is the f block. Okay, so you can use your periodic table kind of as a cheat sheet here. This is another thing that sometimes people may have learned in another course. I actually don't find it to be as useful because you have to take the time to write it down. Um, but it reminds us, if you write the numbers 1 through 7 here, and then 2, and then 3, and then kind of this is for the S's, the P's, and the D's, and then draw lines through here, this shows us how we fill. So it goes 1S, 2S. 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, and so forth. That's the filling order. But you can get that from looking at the periodic table, and then you don't need to write this chart. But whatever way you need to figure out so that you know how to do this, you're going to want to know how to do that to be able to figure out electron configurations. All right, so some tips on writing electron configurations. So we're going to do electron configurations first, and then we're going to take that and we're going to do an orbital diagram. So these are the two big skills from this learning unit. Okay, so let's take chlorine, for example. If we were to look up chlorine on the periodic table, again, kind of come back here, here's chlorine. So I don't want to cheat and look at this table to get its electron configuration, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to walk through and then we're going to write it down. So we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5, okay? So I'm going to kind of come back here and I want to write that down. So we've got 1s2, then we went 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then 3p5. That would be the full electron configuration for chlorine. I want to show you how you can condense this. If you go to the previous noble gas, so the previous noble gas was neon here. Neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So what we can do is we can highlight that portion, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and we can say that this is equal to neon. So if we want to write a condensed, electron configuration, we'd say we've got neon as the onion layer underneath this, and then we've got 3s2 and 3p5. Okay, 
So keep in mind, look at what the problem's asking you to provide um, a full or a condensed electron configuration, okay? Why the condensed electron configuration is okay and usually important is because these electrons are what we refer to as valence electrons. These are the ones that are in the outer onion layer, if you will. They are going to be the ones that participate in doing chemistry. Okay, so we want to know what those electrons are. We kind of don't care about these other guys, which are considered core electrons. They're not really going to be participating in chemistry, so we're just going to kind of ignore them. So again, highlighting a few things to think about how we can write these electron configurations. If you are writing a condensed one, you can use the previous noble gas in brackets. Um, superscript number has specific maximums for each orbital. So notice that we never went above a 2 for our s orbitals. We never went above a 6 for our p orbitals. The maximum for d is 10, for f is 14. And that should make sense based on what we did and worked on with quantum numbers. So again, thinking about how we kind of um, jump rows for our filling rules, I encourage you use your periodic table, right, to know that when we jump around here, we go from 6s to 5d to 4f. So if you know, you can use that little chart, this little chart here if you want, but I like to use the periodic table, best cheat sheet available, okay? I want you to remember weird exceptions, copper and chromium. Remember that that's where we're gonna have, let's kind of take a look at them here. <clears throat> if we look at chromium, look at that S, that 4S electron, that's only one. That's because we took that 1S electron and we moved it up here. Same thing with copper. Okay. One of the things you'll notice is this trend continues with these other guys in the periodic table. I should say up to this, this row. Tungsten, we don't really have that there. But we're going to see that molybdenum, right? Silver, gold, they do the same things. Okay. By the way, there's a reason that copper, silver, gold are precious metals. It's because they're fairly unreactive and it has to do with their electrons, where they are. Okay, so let's just continue, and I know this video was getting a little bit long. I apologize, there was a lot to kind of cover here in terms of theory before we kind of got into practice, but let's take this chlorine atom that we just worked on here, and let's actually do the electron um, orbital diagram for that, okay? So for chlorine, right? We've got chlorine here. Let's write what our electron configuration is again. So it was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Remembering that these guys are our core electrons. So we do not write orbital diagrams for core electrons, or in general, we're not considering them for core electrons. We are going to write electron um, orbital diagrams for our valence electrons. Okay, so here's how we're going to do this. 3s2, 3p5, okay? When we think about the 3s2, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write one box for the s orbital, okay? So I'm kind of going through these steps here. Step one is write a box for each unique L. So L if, uh, equals to zero, which is our s orbital. We're only gonna have one box, and I'm gonna write the m sub L value over top of it, okay? So to highlight what we have here, I'm gonna have one box that is s, and then I'm going to put this m sub l value up top. This was a 3s orbital. Okay. Now let's take these guys. 3p5. If l is equal to 1, then we're talking about p orbitals. We are actually going to have three of them. And they are equal in energy. So I'm going to draw three boxes that are together there. Okay. When we think about, so this is going to be our l of one, which is our p orbital. We're gonna have three p orbitals and we're gonna label these up top, minus one, zero, and plus one, okay? So that's how we sort of set up our orbital diagram. So the first part is actually setting up the orbital diagram. We're gonna have the valence electrons are what contribute to the orbital diagram. S's are always one box, P's will be three boxes. If we had d orbitals, we'd have five boxes. If we had f orbitals, we'd have seven boxes, okay? 
So the next step that we're going to have here is we're going to actually fill the boxes with electrons according to rules that we've already learned. Right? Our off-ball principle says that the ground state electron, uh, ground state distribution of electrons is going to have electrons in the lowest energy states possible. This has given everybody the best seat in the house. Okay. Hun's rule says we got to keep electrons unpaired until we have to pair them. Pauli exclusion principle says when we do pair them, they have to be of opposite spins. So I'm going to go through this slowly, and we're going to number these. Okay. So. This is electron one. And let me kind of zoom this in here. This is electron one. This is electron two. Then I'm going to have three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so I followed all my rules for how I put those electrons in there. And why I counted them is you are going to see a problem where I'm going to ask you, tell me the ticket information for electron number three or electron number seven. You need to be able to give me all four quantum numbers for that electron. So that's why we needed to know how they were filled and we need to find that electron and assign its ticket, okay? So keeping in mind, we couldn't get that information right from here. This is why we had to do the orbital diagram. All right, so see if this makes sense. If I asked you, what is the code for our sixth electron? Okay, the code for our sixth electron. So that's this guy that's right here. This electron that's right here. Okay, what we're going to have is, and I should have written this down below, this is our three p orbitals. Okay, we're in the third row, so n is equal to 3. Okay, l is equal to 1 because we have a p orbital. Now, m sub l, if I'm talking about this electron right here, m sub l is equal to minus 1. And then m sub s is equal to minus 1 half because this electron is spin down. Wow. I know that was a lot, but that's one of the skills that you're going to have to do is I'm going to ask you for a specific electron for a given atom, and I'm going to ask you for their ticket information. I want to know the four quantum numbers for that specific electron. So apologies, I know this video was a little bit long, but there's a lot of content to cover in it, so hopefully we'll be most effective to practice in class.